am a Montessori based uh, dementia care practitioner um, and have written the book. Um, yay. yay! And I'm featured in other books about dementia care, which is nice. And, you know, I started caregiving for my mom um, about 12 years ago. And then now my dad has dementia. So we lived with her, you know, when we took care of her and now I live far away. So it's been a totally different experience. And then I do have a ton of other certifications in movement, mobility, neurology, um, and brain health because, and we see gait changes and movement changes 20 years before people get dementia. Like my, even with my dad, um, now looking back, I understand that it, I should have seen that, you know, 20 years ago. Um, even though he's an athlete and still like swims after there was huge movement changes that I, now what I know, I would have done neuro neurological sports training with him back then had I realized mm -hmm. what was happening. Mm -hmm. So that's why I get certified in a whole bunch of things. Yay. So, <laughs> so we're just going to go over quickly kind of what is dementia and memory, um, how to kind of understand and frame negative behaviors, a lot, a lot about knowing the person um, and why that's important to them living with joy and helping to reduce negative behaviors. And I also just want to recognize that when I talk about um, things, people living well with dementia or living with joy or um, reducing caregiver stress, uh, it doesn't always mean that it's going to be perfect. And I know that like sometimes when we're in it, it seems like that can never, like I used to be really triggered when people would say it can be joyful. And I felt like they were like denying also the grief and all that kind of stuff that happens. And I don't want to do that. I just want to look at, think of like moments of joy and connection that we can try and have, even though a lot of times um, we're dealing with a lot of grief and things that don't make it easy. So I just want to make sure I acknowledge that as well. So um, and then how to use activities to live uh, well or as well as possible. And you can ask questions or post them in the chat at any time. So Dementia is just an umbrella term that means any disorder that causes a loss of memory or intellectual abilities significant enough to disrupt daily living, mostly with older adults, although people um, with Down syndrome and some other things can have very, very early onset dementia as well. Katie, what so, are you learning? What are you learning? <clears throat> Maybe too early to or too off topic, but this with brain fog and yeah. what is there, I guess, is that a, I guess that's probably not a medical, is it a medical term? I don't know. The brain fog. Well, I think yeah. it's starting to become, it's basically just a, a sim, uh, way to describe these symptoms, these neurological symptoms that people are seeing. So they now call, um, they, especially Alzheimer's, but most dementias are an inflammation in the brain in some way. And so, and for, especially with Alzheimer's um, and they're really calling it like type three diabetes because it's linked to insulin resistance causing inflammation in the brain. And a lot of people have insulin resistance, even you can start to have that when your um, insulin numbers are not terrible, but they're a little high. So, and it's super common just because of what we eat here. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's like the brain fog to me, it sounds like it's like going towards memory loss in a it way, is. because, you know, even when I have it, I think, oh my God, oh my mm. God. And, but then, it, you know, there, obviously there's something different about it, but it's becoming a term, like you said, that is so much more in the popular, you know, vernacular where dementia, I do, you're right. I think is you tend to think of older people, right? Even that's not true. So, so that's my mom and my kiddo when he was little. Yeah. Oh, he oh was so God. little. I know. He's so little. He's so cute. Um, oh, and so he looks exactly the same though. He does. I know. He's so face. Um, so, and this is all in the book, you know, just mm -hmm. about that. They're really trying hard to understand their environment and they're not doing things on purpose. They are an adult with a lifetime of experiences and ad adult desires and needs. And I think We'll talk about that a little bit more because that's one of the things that gets taken away from people accidentally. Um, mm -hmm. But it's one of the things that causes most so many behavior problems as well, um, that they don't feel like they have any agency in their life, their dignity is taken away. 
Um, so even here, like Jeffrey, my mom could barely talk when she was mm -hmm. in this and you can tell she can't use her hands. He's asking mm -hmm. her if she likes <laughs> where he's putting the leaf on the note card because um, she could still, she would raise her eyebrows sometimes, she would furrow them if she didn't like it. She would, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. move her head. So always asking um, so that she still had agency in her life in some way. What a sweetheart he was asking her. I know. So memory, uh, it's super simple. It's a stored pattern created by your brain's neurons. Um, and then there's different types of memory. So some of it gets stored longer. Some of it gets stored shorter. You can think of it like that Inside Out movie. It's actually mm -hmm. kind of accurate. Um, and then things that are um, a big deal in your life, happy or sad. So traumatic or not traumatic can get stored really fast. Other things take repetition over and over again. And so the repetition is the part that we use a lot with people with um, dementia. Mm. And so there's two types of, there's a lot of types of memory, but I usually just talk about the long-term memory. There's non-declarative, which is preserved very late into dementia. And this is actually tasks, which is surprising to people because they're like, well, my mom can't brush her teeth anymore. My mom can't, right. paint, my mom can't cook. And that's more because the connection, like, so I always ask people this and it'll be in a little bit later, but like, if I asked you right now to tell me how to tie my shoe, what would be like the first thing you would tell me to do? I would tell you to look, look down at your shoe and your shoelaces, grab both the two sides. Yeah. And, and so that's good. Is that what you meant? Yeah, I got because most I got no yeah. I got nervous. <laughs> it's good because most people are like um are like just they go to um both the shoelaces first, not even looking down, but right that's a that's a neural connection because huh. your brain has to communicate with your head and your eyes to look down. And then you actually have to grab one and the other, right? Mm -hmm. Even though it feels like you're grabbing them at the same time because it's two different brain functions. Like so they, we still have procedural memory really long into dementia. It's just that there's like a, a glitch, a part where it's not connecting. And since it's procedural and it's repetitive, a lot of times the environmental cues or a cue that we give them will trigger their brain to do the thing. So, and then that declarative, like all the autobiographical stuff and history facts, that's the first type of memory usually impaired for most people. Mm -hmm. um, newer autobiographical as a, so they have that regressive memory though. They'll remember stuff from their childhood more than um, something that happened more recently, depending mm -hmm. on the person. Like mm -hmm. um, I have lots of people who are totally up on current events and things like that. And then if you have frontal temporal dementia, normally speech and speech language goes away first, although they can still read. So um, and people assume because they can't talk, they can't read, which is actually not true. They can still read and understand. So we use communication boards a lot. So mm -hmm. it just depends. Yeah. Um, and so we cool. tap into working memory a lot when we're working with people with dementia, because contrary to popular belief, people with dementia can still learn. If you go to a nursing care facility and you sit down at a meal, someone's probably going to come up to you and tell you that you're, you are in their seat. And they probably moved into a memory facility after they had dementia. So people definitely learn. It's just how much is it repeated? What are the environmental cues? You know, the tables are always set up usually in the exact same spot. It's yeah. always, you know, things are very similar. So there are <clears throat> ways that they can learn. And that's what we tap into. Hmm. Um, and yeah, so that it's basically just a breakdown in your neural connections somewhere. And our job is to see where the breakdown is and try and fill in the gaps. Hmm. Um, but processing the information in our brain is the same for us as it is for them. It's the same for everybody. And this is the thing that I think I hope that people start to learn to understand that all of our brains are wired to assess for safety first. And so everything kind of comes in, information comes in through the brainstem, this bottom part of our brain. And it hmm. has to assess if it's safe or not through your limbic system before it goes to all your reasoning, thinking stuff in the front. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other parts in here and the hippocampus is really important in dementia and we can go into a million things, but the simplified version is if you perceive fear, you don't really go to your reasoning part of your brain. You're gonna shut down and that's why we have negative behaviors. Like, have you ever done something you wish you hadn't done? 
So totally. Yeah. And so um tons of things can create feel like my with my mom with hallucinations. Um lights. So the fan, my mom thought that there were raccoons on the ceiling. It was the fan um, shadow going around, right? So her brain is assessing fear. It can't completely put together what it's seeing. And, it, you know, it's visual with um, its memory system. And so it fills in a gap. It makes up a story. And that's it's, what people get I mean, hallucinations. It, it's fascinating, really. I mean, yeah petrifying mm -hmm. you know to think that that's really what she thought yeah it was very clear in that way that that it was something right i i just it, you know but the the fact that it, her brain could do that and make it up is fascinating to me yeah. of all the things in her brain and all the words in there raccoons even you know right I and mean, like there had to have been something at some point that she saw with raccoons in a house or, or I don't know what yeah. she might have known when she was little or but like so that's negative behaviors for us for everybody are for usually because we're scared and our brain goes to what it thinks will keep us safe regardless of whether or not it's healthy or safe for us actually safe like if my kid runs out in the street in front of a car i care about his safety first i'll push him out first of all i'll push him which it could hurt him right. and i'll throw myself in front of a car which right. would hurt me so the brain just goes to whatever is you know and if we have and this is where i think trauma comes in i think people don't realize this a lot um, if your parent, we don't know what their childhood was like, um, might have been bullied, might have had different things happen to them, um, the way they might have protected themselves when they're little might show up. And we may not know that about them. People mm. are like, well, I don't understand why my dad like hits now. Well, you don't know yeah. if that was the only way they survived when they were little, when they yeah. felt scared and like they were unprotected. She knows like her safe places in the house. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not describing it very well, but. No, I mean that she definitely knows exactly where she feels comfortable and like in the kitchen, if you think about it, think of how many decisions we have to make when we're in a kitchen as opposed to if we're in the living room. Yeah. Or any room where you would have had to make a lot of decisions. The brain like knows it's not working right and it will yeah. start to panic and that's why people we don't realize sometimes that people have dementia because they the brain compensates by using a lot of repetitive things like social cues and a lot of times they can hold look like they're holding a conversation totally actually not following it totally so, so she may be like just trying to protect herself from having to make all these decisions in the kitchen so she goes back to where she feels comfortable which is why like we do things like if you know there's certain things she would like to do in the kitchen like get herself a glass of water make like a water station for her that mm -hmm. has a sign that says please um pour your water and then like have a line on the cup if she's not sure how high she's going to fill it, things like that. Mm -hmm. And like demonstrate it to her a few times um, or even just have pictures that show what to do. And a lot of times that'll help people with things that they typically would like to be able to do on their own in a room that's confusing to them, have a few spots yeah. for them. So yeah, and I think this is where I really wish we actually taught people about dementia care because if people understood that repetition and schedule create safety and more independence and more personal agency for them, I think people would stop being like, let's just go out to lunch or let's just do whatever. Right. I'll send her this new thing because I think, I think a um, iPad's easier to use than a computer. I'm going to send her an iPad. It's not easier to use because she's not used it for 10 years right. like a computer, you know? Right. So if we hopefully are talking about that more, um, people will start to understand that they do really need routine. And actually all of us, we forget that most of us have routine right. and schedule. And even mm -hmm. I have ADD and I'm terrible at routine and schedule, but when I have it, I function better. Like we just right. know the way the brain works. Right. We do And that's one of the reasons why I also wanted to create some of the activities that are simple because what I have done with people is say, yeah, you can come visit mom and this is the activity that you can do with her. So she is getting a repetitive process even. And then the other person, you know, gets the I'm helping and I want to see this person 
thing yeah. at the same time. And then you're not asking her to go to someplace new or all right. those things. I mean, even chairs in a restaurant were stressful. So I, yeah, you know, behavior is a form of communication. And mm -hmm. so always ask, why is this behavior happening? And it can never be because of dementia ever, ever, ever. Um, and that's just because a cue for us to look at the underlying cause, you know, something in the environment. Um, I try to tell people to look at patterns of time, place, um, and to also think about what their life would have been like before. Like I had one woman, I used to go in and do activities all the time at one facility and it was always around like 2.30 and then like at three, she'd get really agitated and would be asking about her daughter all the time. And so the facility, of course, is like, oh, she's coming to visit in a few days. Oh, let's go sit down. Oh, she's coming to visit in a few days. Let's go sit down. Oh, she's kind of like the thing that they tell you to do all the time. And so I asked her daughter, um, and I, this may have just been because I was a parent, but I noticed like that's normally when I would have picked up my kid from school. Mm -hmm. So I asked her daughter when she used to get home from school. And so that was what she was perceiving she was supposed to be doing. And so we um, did, so then I would talk to her about her daughter and like made a little activity around making cookies that her daughter would like. And then the people in the care facility could eat the cookies. So she met the need, we got the need met of con some sort of emotional connection with her daughter um, and stopped awesome. the repetitive, you know, thing every single day at the exact same time. Yeah. Um, and then to look at things like, you know, I like the, um, fan with my mom, somebody may be upset because they're seeing shadows somewhere. They used to do this thing where people would put, um, black rugs on the floor in front of doors to scare people with dementia because they think it's a black hole. This used to be very common in care facilities. People, so people still suggest this, which boggles my mind to do in people's homes. Like if your loved one's leaving, they suggest putting a black mat in front of oh their door. God instead of could we create that environment so that first of all find out why do they want to leave and try and see if we can do some things there or create an and create an environment where um you know there might be a different way we can direct them to not you know use the door or things like that but so even having rugs on your floor somebody might be scared in someone else's house or even in their own house if there's something on the floor if there's shadows if the lighting's bad if they can't see the cup that they're supposed to be drinking out of so like usually glass or clear cups aren't as good as something they can see and um they may need to use the bathroom but can't see it so there's a million reasons um oh. so we talk about observation a lot and um that that what causes the negative behaviors are usually two things that they feel like they've had a, a loss of any kind of agency. And my mom would always say, people take everything away from people with dementia. And understandable because like if she's trying to cook and then burns everything, you think, oh, she can't cook anymore instead right. of, oh, she can't cook in this way anymore, but how can I still help her cook? Um, mm -hmm. and we can do that. And I just don't think we've been taught that yet. At least, or she hasn't displayed any of those things. Yeah. It really depends on the person. It's so what's been interesting is that I think negative behaviors are what people ask about the most. Um, but my mom didn't really have a ton of negative behaviors either. She had the anxiety okay. stuff, um, yep. the hallucinations, which we typically by then had learned to like look around, see what's happening. And, um, you know, a lot of concern around the calendar and things like that for a little bit before we knew what she was, do we were doing, she thought we took some of her things because she had asked us to take all her jewelry. She said who she wanted to give stuff to. And so we yeah. labeled it all and we had put it away. And for some people, I would say, if you don't see it for, you're probably not going to see it, which is really good. And I would say, just watch for um, her not her shutting down, if she tends to be an anxious person, the behavior I would yeah. look for is like the shutting down behavior. Oh, she doesn't like to shower, but she will do it. Mm -hmm. She doesn't argue or anything. She just doesn't, she will just try to say like, oh, I'm so tired, I just wanna lay down. When she's done, she's near tears with gratitude. Yeah, yeah. So it is, it's like, it is for her, like, like you said, um, over not overcompensating but it you know yeah, yeah. she's definitely probably f doesn't feel 
and it, that, that has nothing to do with you, but something about it doesn't quite make her feel safe. And so she's, right. you know, having yes. some response. So for her, yeah, that would probably be considered a negative behavior. And we could look at even just your process for showering and things like that yeah. and see yeah. if there's little things to change. Um, like the, I think I read in the book or it was from you, one or the two, like the heater in the bathroom, yeah. game changer, the mm -hmm. running the water much warmer than I would have expected game yeah. changer, um, explaining to her, reminding her why we shower. Yeah. Um, telling her, you know, she's in there a max of like five minutes, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's fast. Once she's in there, she's fine. It's the anxiety and the buildup to the actual process of it. Right. Yeah. And so that's the same thing that those of us with executive functioning disorder and ADD have, we cannot initiate a task because we're so, our brain is so scared that we will either mess up the task, forget what we're doing. Like our brain thinks all of these things could go wrong with this task, so it won't start it. Once we start, because it's a repetitive process, we can usually then keep doing the thing. So their yep. brain is very similar, which it's, is why you notice she's fine once she gets in, but beforehand. Um, some people, like if you have like the picture communication board about the shower and it's super short and they know the shower is going to be three things that can yeah. calm their brain that um like I started doing this thing with dishes because I in my brain I think the dishes take like an hour right and it's so hard and blah 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 so I started anytime I make tea I'll do dishes and then I notice that usually a whole entire sink full of dishes takes me five minutes Right. Because I have, because the other thing is same with ADD, um, people with dementia often have time blindness. They don't mm -hmm. know how long time is actually passing and how long it takes to do anything. So if she is right. tired or whatever, she may also perceive a shower is going to take forever and her brain doesn't know that it won't. Yeah. One of the, that's, that's exactly what happens to her. Like she thinks we're going to be in there all day. Yeah. You know? And I'll, one of the game changers we decided was like, we stopped washing her hair in the shower mm -hmm. and getting her hair done, like yeah. making it separate because the hair was what was taking so long yeah, and was extending her time. And she was panicking about it. And right. so we took that off and it was so much easier. And her anxiety, I think was reduced too. Yeah. That's awesome. Right. And I'm hoping that that's what people realize things can be simple changes that we can, you know, do to help people yeah. not have so much angst. Yeah. Um, that's my mom again. But so, so cute. The, know the person I need to put in here to also for people that don't work with their own loved one to know their pronouns and even their, like, does, does someone like to be called like Miss Katie or yeah. just their last name or whatever. And so and one of the things I talk about with activities is I got this question. Sometimes people are like, especially like the activity that I'm going to show, people are like, well, it looks simple or it looks, um, I mean, technically we're doing an activity right now. Yeah. In a way. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm watching Netflix, I'm doing activity. When I'm um, playing card games, I'm doing an activity. So what I when I'm getting myself water, I'm doing activity. All we're doing is taking normal life activities and to a, a place where um, it's more accessible to their brain. And so like people play matching card games all the time. Uh, like shoot, war? war is, yeah, like yeah. So there's war or there's go fish and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, and then we have a ton, we like tabletop games and there's a whole bunch that are the cards flipped over and then you flip them and then you have to like match them. They just add extra stuff, right? They add like another thing you have to grab in the amount of time that it takes somebody else to look at a card, but they're all the same, built on the same principle. And um, activities for our brain like that increase oxygen to the brain and also help keep that procedural memory, matching as a procedural memory, picking things up as a procedural memory. If you still want them to be able to button a shirt or be able to eat using like actual hands-on activities is a big deal. So, um, and a lot of people do like to play and we forget that. Like that's mm -hmm. like just imagination and art and creativity and play is one of the things that in emotion 
emotional connection lasts all throughout the course of dementia. There's great studies on that. Mm -hmm. But every time somebody sees an activity that looks fun, they think it's pointless, which is interesting. Like I, I'm not going to give that to my mom. And, but it's so important for our brains, you know, even for us, like people now should start putting in more like, you know, uh, play, everybody's playing Wordle right now. It's the exact same thing. Yeah. So yeah, it's super important. So interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So knowing all the things that they like or would have liked, and also knowing that maybe their job or certain things may not be something they still want to do now. Like I've had people be like, oh, they were, um, a mail delivery, you know, they delivered mail and, um, so they're a mail carrier. So we're going to make an activity for them. Um, that's, you know, about mail, which can be great unless they're like, Hey, I'm retired. I don't want to do that yeah. anymore. You know? So, um, so you probably already know this, but you know, what is like one hobby that you have or something for me? Yeah. Oh God. I, I swear I have no hobbies. Um, I love to travel. I love to read. Um, I like yoga. Perfect. Is that an, is that okay? Yep. That's perfect. So that covers hobbies, interests, and then a role in your life could be anything. I'm a sister. Yeah. And so I totally could automatically think of a way to make an activity around you being a sister. You could, I can. Yeah. So I would probably do um, some sort of really simple memory book using pictures of you with your siblings and like a one. So the things that I made, they have yeah. one card that comes with each picture that has a short oh. thing with it. I would do the same thing. We could also make these three part cards and put pictures of your siblings on it. So it. people assume there's no way to keep ro- uh, roles in relationships, but we can just mm-hmm. not a kind of. And that's why I like the activities because you can do the same thing and um, keep those connections and use something really similar over and over again, but for different emotional needs and things. So Mm -hmm. um, again, activities because it maintains dignity through role and having as much choice as possible. Um, And so by activities, like I'm gonna show you an activity that is these cards, but the same concepts apply with brushing your teeth, getting dressed, doing your hair, you know, so um, like one of the methods that we use is to the demonstrate and follow method, which is in my book. So you might have read about it, but I do one step and I ask them, would you like to, you know, I ask them to follow, would you like to do the next one, whatever. So some people that um, seem like they can't brush their hair anymore. If, if I try and brush my hair and then ask them to also do the same. And also we have mirror neurons in our brain. So automatically we, we mimic what other people do. So someone may start brushing their hair if I'm brushing my own hair. Um, I totally, I totally use that. It works like a charm. Yay. It, it, uh, so glad. I mean, it's a, it is fascinating. My mom, I'll say, let's go brush your hair. We'll go in the, in the bathroom. She looks in the mirror at me and I make one motion like this. And she, she knows exactly what to do and starts doing it. Yeah. I don't have to say a word after mm-hmm. that. And then she's fine. She starts and she can do the whole thing and she, yeah. she'll start to prep prim even a little bit. Yeah. Um, and it, it works so much better than just the verbal part. Right. Which I, is what I was doing for a long time and couldn't understand why she didn't know what it meant. Mm-hmm. And then that one action, everything changed. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that we kind of don't talk about that enough and we give lots of verbal cues or even like people are like, well, why would you put pictures all over the house of like how to turn on the water? Because a lot of times they'll turn on the water if there's just a picture of it there. Um, they just don't make sure it's a picture of your actual sink. <laughs> For some people, some people do it. Oh them, yeah, but some people need a picture of their actual sink. Or, gosh, help us with all of the new handles and whatevers. Or everything looks sleek with no handle, and then people with dementia can't open a cupboard. So, exactly. and so then the other thing is trying to figure out when can activities be used. Like, if there's an emotional need or a repetitive question that could be answered through an activity, um, like the example I used with the woman who wanted to pick up her daughter from school. Um, 
or we do use memory books a lot for repetitive questions. So if someone's asking all the time about one specific thing, create a little book that provides the answer that is always in the same place that they always know where to get it from. So the cue that you give them is, um, why don't you read your book with the, I don't know, dog on the front of it, whatever. Because my mom used to ask where the dog was all the time. <laughs> um, and so that can answer the question and also the visual and everything um, makes the answer kind of last longer in a way because they're mm. looking at the dog there. So, and they have to feel something, just telling them something. We remember better when we use our site, you know, tactile, all that kind of stuff. So the more that kind of stuff you can put together, yeah, um, the better. And also people just get bored and they rummage and things like that because they don't have anything to do. <laughs> They're so cute. I know. Um, so yeah, mom would just, I think this was the day that they started to realize that you could put edamame on the end of a fork and then hit the fork and then it would fling. I'm like, mom, you never let me play with my food, but this is awesome. So that's oh. the thing. My mom was fun, has always been fun, but was always trained that you can't play games. You can't do things that are fun. But when her, when she got dementia, it was like, yeah, now we're gonna do fun stuff. So yeah, why not? Right. So it was super oh. cute. Um, and so I think I've been focusing kind of my dementia care stuff a little bit more on learning dementia care through activities, because for me, it was super stressful to have to go take classes and do all this stuff. And then they're like, here's all these things you can do with your loved one. And I'm like, and I got to go make everything. And now I have to like right. figure out how to do whatever. So if I can teach people some activities they can do with somebody where you have, where you learn to communicate with your loved one, doing this activity to, you know, let's say it's woodworking, to sand a little like pig figure and, um, you know, use the tack cloth on it after to take the sand off. If you can guide somebody through that and help them with that, it's same gonna be if you are helping them brush their teeth. Now you mm -hmm. already know how to communicate with them in a place that was like safe for both of you, that wasn't like an essential task where somebody had to brush their teeth and everybody's all stressed out to no end. Or what would you recommend for like, I'd love to try and garden with her a little bit, mm -hmm. but I don't know when to decide, like, she doesn't like this. Like, yeah. like, you know what I mean? Like balance, trying it and seeing if she does. Sometimes I think she will do stuff just because it, it is me and her doing it. Yeah. She not, might not really like it. So I don't know how to figure that out, you know? Right. Well, a couple things. For those of us who will do things that other people like that we don't really like, yeah. <laughs> um, typically uh, like I'll do stuff that my son likes that I don't really like because I want to spend time with him. Yeah. So it's still fine actually, even if, you know, okay. she, if it's not her jam, Okay. Um, you'll usually notice that they lose interest really fast or always look for like a furrowed brow or, yeah. you know, squinty mouth, like all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, or if they say things like, oh, I'm, whatever things she would have said before, that would have been acceptable reasons to leave something. Look okay. Those. I'm feeling tired. I have a headache, yep. all that kind of stuff. Okay. So yeah, look for those. And then at the same time though, especially uh, if you do know that it's something that she might like, some of the things you might want to play around with is just how is it presented as well. Okay. So it may not, it may be something she's having a hard time with because of the way it's presented also. So you kind of want okay. to do that. Um, so like, like with gardening, I've set up a lot of those um, types of activities for people. And for some people, it can be a sign that says, please water the flowers. So like this sign I have says, please match the yeah. pictures. And then there is a little bit of an indicator here. Yep. So for a lot of people, it just says, please water the flowers. And there's a picture of a watering can. Um, oh, I see. Flowers. Uh -huh. For some people, that's fine. For uh -huh. other people, I have to have a watering can where I water one yeah. flower and then I say, would you like to water the next one? And then I'll point to the flower. Um, okay. So it really depends. And I think, okay. I love that um, more places are like, okay, we need to know the person. And then I think what is helpful to look for is, do they know how to do task breakdown? Do they know how to give environmental cues? Do they know how to control for error? Do they know how to make templates? Do they know how to use color for Q? all that kind of stuff? So okay. All the things. Um, and so 
we talk about environmental press a lot. This comes from the um, disability work in creating, mm -hmm. you know, places where people can, how much pressure does the environment put on you? If I, you know, have a wheelchair and I'm in a house like this where I can't wheel my wheelchair up to under the sink, that's a huge amount of environmental press. And so with people with dementia, there's that everywhere. Like that bathroom is what you will see in almost every care facility in the world. But most people can't see the toilet or the toilet paper or the grab bars because they're all white. Uh, I see. So um, part of it is looking at so much of it depends on how the environment is set up and then how we cue somebody's brain to do something. Um, like I'll take the doors off of cabinets because people still like to put their own dishes away, but they can't see them. Yeah. Things like that are like these cabinets, nobody can see where the knobs are. Knobs are. Mm -hmm. This plate is pretty, but my mom would have picked at all those little flowers and thought they're bugs. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so this is just a little checklist of some of the things to check for. Um, and so this is what we talked about with task breakdown. So I'll show that with the cards. I think what people forget is just keep thinking, is there a way to break down this task even more? Um, like uh, if I need to, so when I'm talking to my dad on Skype and the microphone's not on, right? Mm -hmm. People are like, just go to like, uh, they'll be like, just wiggle your mouse and this thing will come up in the corner and click on it. Too many steps. Right. It sounds very simple to us, but it's too many steps. Uh, and so to use templates. So a lot of times what I, so like for one thing I did for him is I made cards that had um, each step of using Zoom and you flip the card and it would have like a huge, so, and I just took pictures of his computer, exactly what it looks like. And yep. so, um, and then took pictures of his, the, the keyboard. keyboard. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so I would say, um, if I can't hear you, uh, press here and it would have, like, I would put a red, like dot over yep. mouse and put a red dot on the mouse templating and stuff like that's really helpful. Um, and all this stuff similar, you know, like asking mm -hmm. questions as people start to have a hard time thinking of their own answers give simple choices, use communication cards. Um, and like we talked about with, um, if they can't find a word, kind of ask them to describe it first before you just go with automatically giving them a word, stuff like that. Um, and always watch your facial expression and all that kind of stuff. And then this is just like the whole, like, instead of asking, what do you want to wear today? You might eventually get to, would you like to wear the pink or yellow shirt? And Providing. So much easier. Oh, so much. It easier. is. So with these, this is just kind of an example of what people, so this on the, what is this? Your, this should be on your left, left mm -hmm. uh, theater. Oh my gosh. I still do stage right. Stage. Oh, stage. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so you would probably see this as an activity in a dementia care facility and it's not a good activity because there's too many options. Too many things, yeah. Way too many things. And so, and there's no template, there's no queuing, there's no way for this person. So people will be like, oh, this person liked to color. I'm gonna do this with them and then wonder why they can't do it. You know, paying bills, um, it's too dark. And the other one, you know, the lady looks fine, but it, that was just to show like, maybe some people don't want you to, did you ask, can I put your shirt on for you? You know, right. did you even say I'm gonna, <laughs> um, yeah did you ask if they wanted to wear the pink shirt or the white shirt or whatever? So, and I think that we can't always give choice in everything just right. in all of our lives. Like I don't get a choice in everything at work, but the more right. choice that I have in a lot of things, the easier it is to not feel um, like depressed and anxious. And like people are taking things away from me if I get choice in other places. So, uh, and this is the little sheet that I was going to send you. I'm going to send oh, you. Oh, good. So this is like what you can use. And I would say also use this in good stuff. Like if you notice something she really, really loves, use this as well. The behaviors okay. are, you know, she's happy, she's engaged, you know, all this kind of stuff so that you remember what worked and what didn't. And then okay. also, you know, in times when things aren't working. So you want to look at like, when we talked about like patterns, environment, personal or emotional needs. So, um, and then is there some fear that might be going on or anything else that you notice? And then on the other side, kind of things that you could change or try, or maybe <clears throat> an activity you could make to help with that. 
kind of whatever's going on. Or if yeah. you know someone really likes an activity, what's another one you could make that's very similar on a different topic or something like that? Or could you use that same technique with something else like cooking? Like if you know something in gardening works really well, is there a similar connect you, technique you could use in cooking? So, um, and then this is the three part cards. And so I don't know if you've seen an activity like this before. Um, no. So this is a Montessori activity. Um, and then I added these, also these story cards with them. Um, and it's basically matching. And the purpose of it is to have an activity about a topic your person would like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so right now is I've got cross stitch, woodworking and planes. Mm -hmm. um, and then the reading cards that go with it that you could use in a few different ways. That's um, kind of an additional thing that I made. But the those three part cards, there's the control card, which is the one with the picture and the word. And then there's the other two cards, just the picture and just the word. Um, okay. And so we'll just talk about like what types of dementia care principles they're actually using. Montessori, we always put things on a tray. Um, and so like, and we use, so you don't have to be super technical about this stuff or like, you know, it's just, if your person's having a hard time doing things, you might want a mat that has a template on it, right? You, okay. if you're gonna, so sometimes if I put this out, we leave these in care facilities all the time, just like this. And mm -hmm. then um, if we've shown them a few times how to use it, a lot of people are still early enough where they could just take this off a shelf or sit down in front of it and they'll set it up themselves and they'll use it themselves. But if this was red and this was red, they wouldn't be able to see it, so. Something. And you picked red intentionally. Yeah, I try to make it bright. And then, okay. so the cards, there's 10 cards in each pack, or there's 10 items in each pack. Um, and in Montessori, so let's say all of these cards are about cross stitch. What they'd normally do to control of error just means to try and make things um, as failure free as possible to cue your brain of what you wanted them to do. Normally, all the cards in this pack would be like a green background because you want to remember that this whole pack goes together. The only thing is what I did with for people with dementia is instead each card has its own color because then they can match based on color even if they can't read or they're having a hard time seeing the picture. So using the same principles just modified for them. Mm -hmm. um, so in the beginning, want to see how much somebody can do on their own by just demonstrating it the simplest way um, or one of the simplest ways. So you bring everything over and then you bring out your cards and you bring out your mat and then take away the tray. Mm -hmm. Don't do this, see all my stuff over here. This is to remind me to use <laughs> um, But then you bring out, so this mat has the template on it. Okay. They're gonna totally use it themselves. Don't make a double-sided template because then they won't okay. use. Yep. I'm gonna flip this this way because that would be more of what you can see. Um, so you always sit on their dominant hand side so that they can grab whatever else you're going to be using. So with these, there's a, your control cards. You just take out the whole stack and they go on one side. And then what you do is demonstrate. And with Montessori, mostly you don't talk. And that is because the mirror neurons and people pay attention more if they're not okay. hearing words. Um, but you can. So a lot of times what I'll do is use just, I'll just be short about things. So I'm trying to show someone that what I want to do is match th to this card. Your okay. Card. So I'll do this. I'll come here and I'll point to both, possibly like wonder a little bit. And then I might say, these don't match. Okay. Put this back here. So the first time you demo it, set it up so you don't have to go through a whole bunch of them before you Okay. Go. And then I would do the same thing here. And I would say that matches and I would put it over here. Okay. And then I would do demonstrate doing the same thing with the words right here. Okay. Here. Doesn't match, put it in. I didn't set that up right, right. But then I would eventually <laughs> get to this one and I would say matches and I would put it here. And then I would say, would you like to try the next one? So we always give people a choice. If they say no, then cool. So if they say no, I often will say, do you mind if I do another one? So um, 
and or do you mind being with me while I do another one? So the yeah. being the process because um, they may want to do it later and they they may feel like they can't do it now. So mm -hmm. that my mom lo will respond so positively to those two things, no okay. matter what it yeah. is. Yeah. Hey, how would you set? How would you like set it up and say like that you're going to do something? Okay. So I would probably say that um, you know like what I used to do with my mom is I found, I made some cards about cross stitch and I know mm -hmm. that you like to cross stitch. Would you um, like to look at the cards with me? Okay. You know, mm -hmm. um, or if it is someone that already does like games, I might use the word game, like okay. have a, you know, crossfit, a cross, crossfit, cross stitch <laughs> matching. Would you like to do that with me? Um, so okay. with this, when you clear it, um, I would, take away these. So um, you could just keep going through it over and over again, but I usually say like, start with three cards. So like three items or three or four. So I normally take these away because having them in here might be too many options. And then, so it decreases the options over time. And so Katie, did you, do, did, are, is the size of those intentional? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the regular ones in a Montessori classroom are this big. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're pretty little. So most okay. of the time people can't see the pictures on these okay. um, or the text is too small and they're hard because okay. they're tiny. And I also laminated them, which you don't have to do, but you should print them on at least like 65 pound cardstock. So it's thicker. Okay. Yep. And if you laminate it, you have to be careful because most laminate is, do you see the glare? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> But um, if you have your own laminator, you can buy matte laminate or um, there are places that will laminate it with matte laminate. You, it just has to be a place that actually does business printing. So like um, Office Max doesn't have it, but if I were to go like get something made from an actual business place, like a printer place. A they pr use yeah. It. So, okay. Um, I wish the non-glare came everywhere. Yeah. Um, so then we, I usually just clear all of these and put them away somewhere. And then I say, would you like to try the next one? And if they have no idea what to do, I usually tap here and see if they take it out. So mm -hmm. all of this stuff is just queuing. If they don't take it out, I could hand it to them. Um, if they're not sure what to do with it, I would point back and forth, you know, so there's, you just want to keep demonstrating to them what you want them to do. Yeah. Now, if, somebody because right now I'm actually showing somebody multiple steps we do this one first this didn't match oh also if they do that it doesn't matter say nothing right. it's totally whatever fine. okay can, right and then they bring out this one and this one does match Woohoo! um but um then I just what I did demonstrate was write these like multiple steps and did a whole chunk um and then asked them if they wanted to do it that could be too much for some people so what I do in that situation is I demonstrate just this part of the card. Yeah. And I don't even do the words yet. Or have your own set that's ordered the same way. So you check your first card and then ask them to check their card. So they're doing the literally exact same thing as you, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, and that's where I think like when people bring in activities and they're like, oh, whatever doesn't work, it's more just because they didn't know how to take a step back um, yeah. to see if there was a way to make the step um, simpler or to demonstrate the step one step earlier um, than before. So that's like the basic way to use them as this first setup. And then in all these kits, I have these other options. So there's a lot of people who um, can do two cards at a time where they put one here and one here, and then they match, right? So it really depends on the person. Okay. Um, and then if you print the cards double, if you printed these double, do you remember the old matching game where you flip things over? Mm -hmm. You can do that with them too. Yeah. She might like that. Yeah. So um, she would like the words because, you know, she did used to read a lot. And so yeah. Even like if we get like, she'll, I'll have her help me do in the mail. Yeah. And if she gets a card or something, she likes to read it out loud. I was like, oh, who's that from? And then it's, she yep. starts to read it. And so I think it also like, 
I don't know if this just could be me, but it, I almost feel like she's like rem reminding herself that she can still do it. Yeah, and I think that also, I think that we have an idea of dementia in our brain before we ever get it, that we can't do things. So that's also a problem. Like, it's just what you're told, right? Um, Absolutely. So like with the cards, for some people who wouldn't know to pick up the card and read it, you might just hand this to her and say, could you read this card and she'd be fine. Sometimes yeah. I read it first and then I say, would you like to read it? If people are having a hard time seeing things, you follow it with your finger or so some forms of dementia come with a problem focusing your eyes. Mm -hmm. So you cover one, just like when you used to get your tests for your eyes mm -hmm. and that can help. So with these, what I did um, is that it's one, it's kind of one fact about something. Okay, this is a cool fact. So these scissors, I don't know if you do embroidery. These, have you seen? No, but I saw them and I thought they were pretty. They are very cute. They're stork yeah. scissors and I've used them yeah. all the time. I had no idea that they're, so midwives would carry them in there. They had clamps, the clamps were stork shaped and they would have their embroidery bag and their midwifery bag, midwifery bag. And so people started to make also embroidery scissors that look just like the stork clamps. Isn't that cool? I wonder if the stork, if that's where like the stork bring delivers the baby came right? from. Right, like you could fall. So that's the other thing. That's totally a conversation you could have with your mom based on one card. Yeah. Right, so yeah. not only could she read it or you read it or you read it first and ask her to read it, and then you could, that could be the activity or you could like chat about, oh my gosh, I didn't know that. Like, yeah. Um, or she'll, she'll say like stork, stork, like yeah. she's trying to picture it. Mm -hmm. But if I show her the picture of something, yep. she's like stork, you know? Yes. So it, you know, that's, that cue alone has been a life changer too. Like when we're deciding on food, right. you know, or, or something. She'll say pizza, pizza. Show her a picture on that. Like he'll pull up a picture on his iPad and say like That's awesome. pizza. So at least she feels like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and that's the other thing, like you could read this card together and have three cards in front of you. So you read about the stork scissors and then you could say, mom, could you help me find the stork scissors? And yeah. there's multiple different cues. Fortunately for this card, there are multiple different cues. They're, they look like a stork. They also look like a scissor. They say Scissors. scissor. But do you see one thing I did that wasn't right here? Do you see this is green? My table's green and the card is green. That's why you want a contrasting color. If she couldn't tell at all, she probably would notice that this matched this card because of the color. So there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can use these to kind of, you know, um, do little like activities together or the original of these before you cut them out, they're on an eight and a half by 11. You could literally print out this, this and put it in a book and someone could read with her about, you know, what are we doing? Cross stitch. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I tried to make them versatile, um, but something that's pretty simple to use. And also like then realize, so this template of where things go. When people aren't sure about brushing their teeth, sometimes I will make a template on their sink that is made out of plastic that has a place for the cup and a place for the toothpaste and stuff like that. Um, yeah, she like, we, uh, yeah, like we've, I, I've been trying to figure out, like she has, we have it in a certain place now and it's downstairs so she can, dad's been helping her brush her teeth after breakfast or whatever. But if you say it to her, like, let's get your toothbrush and your toothpaste. I, I like, it's in the right place and I can guide her there, but she mm -hmm. will pick it up. So um, yeah, there's a few things you could try. What kind of toothbrush is it? Just like a manual one. Okay. You um, know, if, like a, yeah. So if the very first thing she usually does is pick up her toothbrush, if you put the toothbrush in a cup, you could put a label on the cup that says, please pick up your toothbrush. Okay. Um, or something like that. Um, this is why I know it's stressful to people to have to do multiples of things, but that's sometimes why I'd have another toothbrush that looks exactly the same next to it. And I would pick it up and see if she would pick up hers. Oh, okay. Um, you know, when you hand it to her, does it go well after that? 
Yeah. Yeah.